Okay, we're back live here in Germany for HP Discover Frankfurt, Germany. This is theCUBE, SiliconAngle.com's flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. We're here to cover HP and find out the latest and greatest what's going on with the company. Obviously, HP um, is a huge technology company announcing a lot of different news. I'm John Furrier, founder of SiliconAngle.com. Join with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. Go there, check out all the research uh, from peers. Uh, we're here with Frederick Van Haren, who's the senior uh, director of the R&D labs at a company called Nuance Communications, a Massachusetts-based company, a public firm, very interesting uh, uh, firm. Frederick, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate you coming on theCUBE. So, you know, Nuance is again a company that I've known a little bit over the years, and I've followed Dragon Systems, which I know yep. is one of your products, and uh, so I'd, I'd love to hear the story again of, uh, of Nuance Communications. Why don't you start there? Sure, so um, Nuance is a worldwide uh, technology provider for uh, imaging and speech technology. So when you think about imaging, uh, think about the technology that's embedded in the scanner, so you, when you scan, you end up with an image, and the products we provide on the imaging side will allow you to convert that image in an editable, word, editable uh, document, like a PDF or a Word document. So other, the other side of the, the company, which you mentioned, which is speech. Mm. So there are actually three components to speech. There is the text-to-speech component to it. So text-to-speech is basically the computer talking to you. So imagine a GPS. If you have a GPS, TomTom, -tom, Garmin talks back to you. So that's our technology. Does that in different languages and allows you to get street by street guidance, left and right. Really? Okay, so, so much of the turn-by-turn the -turn voices right. are, are you. That's correct. Mr. T, too, and Mr. T says, take a, take a rat, fool. That's <laughs> you guys? There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the text-to-speech component. So you, you also have the, the opposite, where you talk to the machine. That's the, uh, the other product you, you brought up. Uh, we have a desktop product called Dragon Naturally Speaking. Uh -huh. We have that available in uh, multiple languages. Um, very, very, very popular um, product nowadays. Uh, other technologies, we, uh, where our technology is embedded is mobility. So a good example there is we have apps for um, the iPhone and Android, um, Dragon Search. So you, you can make a request basically saying, please find the nearest restaurant or Chinese restaurant. Your phone has built-in GPS, so it knows where it is. We'll send that information to us. We will handle the query and give you a list back of restaurants or movies or whatever your, 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 your question was about. Now, you're in the R&D labs side of the that's business, right? That's talk, correct. Talk, talk about your role there, and what is that, that whole R&D labs yes. all about? So, so, it's more specifically about speech recognition. So, if you look at a, a, a speech recognizer, there are really three components to it. The first thing is, is what the user is saying. The second component is is the, the recognizer. The recognizer is a piece of software that is going to compare whatever you are saying with something which we call a language model. A language model is a, a data subset of all the data we own, and that's what we ship with the product. So eventually, your voice is going to be compared with the language model. Now, you have to imagine that we have petabytes and petabytes of storage. Now, there's no way when we sell Dragon yeah. that I can put petabytes of storage on your, on your laptop. So we, we have to make decision what goes, what doesn't go. So once you, once, uh, once you go through a recognition, the engine will, if for example, you could say, the question could be yes or no. You could say, okay, yes. Now what the system will do is we'll say, I think for 80% the person said yes, for 10% the individual said no, and for another 10% I have no idea what the individual said. Now, in order to improve um, the, the recognition results for everybody. So as a native speaker, American English might be a lot easier for you. You will get a better accuracy than for me. But from a user usage perspective, we want everybody, even people with accents or dialects, to be as su successful as possible. The only way for us to do that is to collect more use user data. Now, once you have collected that user data, it has to get into the language model in some way or form. So you need and a high performance computing environment that continuously process that data such that your language model can be updated on a regular basis such that the, the accuracy and, and the success rate goes up all the time. An interesting component is mobility. So you have a cell phone. Now, 
typically we provide a language model that is generic for everybody. Now when you call with your cell phone, we pretty much know your number. And that means that we can attach uh, a personalized language model to you. So one of the things we're doing today is to improve the accuracy by every time you call or you make a request, we basically say it's you and we improve the language model and every day, if you would say the same thing day, of, day, day after day after day, the, the accuracy should go up over time. So even, you know, if even your, your, your dialect or, 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 you know, if you have difficulties pronouncing certain words, eventually the system will take care of you individually. So, okay, so how does that work though? So I've got a cell phone, I've got a cell phone provider. Yep. AT&T happens to be my provider. That's right. Uh, and what, I uh, uh, give a, some kind of opt-in to allow you that's, to, that's right. so to monitor my yeah, voice so in, in exchange you're going to improve it, right? Yep. So let's go to the flow. So let's assume you have an iPhone, you go to iTunes, you download the, um, the Dragon Search app. Yep. The Dragon Search app indeed has, has a, a legal footnote saying, uh, you know, are we allowed to process your data, yes, no. Yep. Let's go with the flow, let's assume you say yes. So now, every time you use the app, that data will actually go to our production site. So our production site is responsible for just doing the recognition. What that means is you say something and the, 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 the recognizer, the production recognizer, will give you the results. Now, it doesn't stop there. What really happens in the background is whatever you said in your ID is now being passed to the research environment, which is where I come in. So I get all that incoming data, I get the IDs, and then over time we process the new language models, which we then push back to the production side. So the next time you use the app, the production side says, oh, I know this individual, and we have a special language model for them, and that's where the whole story goes. So the more you use the system, the better it will work oh, for so you. But it's massive, massive amounts of data, right? That's uh, right. Now, now you're moving that data around, are you not, in, in a way, or? Um, well, yeah, so let, let's define moving it around. So we have a, a large HPC environment that is uh, about 15,000 hard drives. It's over 10 petabytes of storage. So the amount of data we move around locally it's about uh, 160 gigabits a second. Yeah, so that's so that it locally you, th that you move a lot of data, but it's fast. That's right. The HPC environment, yes. getting the data in, even itself, you've got multiple access yes. points, you know, pounding on your system, right? That's or right. In, yep. in, 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 intruding into your system. So yes. that's that's an architectural challenge as well. It, it is. Not? Yeah. So we have to design what we call our own platform. So we we buy. We buy the traditional hardware, but yeah. we, we had to introduce or build our own platform that allows us to deal with 15,000 hard drives and, and we double every year. So the, the capacity doubles, the, the performance doubles. You, you, just, you just need to keep up. You're scaling, so, so <laughs> that's amazing. So what, what, how would you describe your biggest storage challenges? What, what are they? Is it just be, being able to ingest that or process yeah. that or all of the above? I think the biggest challenge is, so it, it's capacity and performance combined. So we, we need more capacity in order to, to, um, to be able to absorb more data. However, at the same time, we also need a decent amount of, of CPU power to process that. Now, the more CPUs you add to hit your storage, the more performance you have to add. So the challenges there are to, to, to add more devices, storage devices that help you in that area. Typically you, you, typically you can choose capacity or performance. The moment you say I want capacity and performance, you're, you're basically asking for the impossible. Yeah, they're going in different directions. That's right, and, and, and because of that, we always try to work with vendors and, and, and we have an extremely good relationship with HP where we, we expose our problem and they, they find ways to introduce some features in the product that uh, over time will help us. So it's not, you know, it's not just buying what's on the market, it's also <laughs> providing HP, or through the engineering um, section, providing them enough information so that they really can help you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Frederick, I want to ask you a question about um, just kind of changing topics around, obviously nuances, back end, when you think about data ingestion. Yes. So, um, forget about HP for a second, just from your company's perspective, how do you deal with all this new data 
um, that you want to store on the back end. Is, is there a data explosion that you're experiencing and how are you guys handling it? For example, are you looking at things like Hadoop? Are you looking at uh, what is your storage strategy relative to like Hadoop, for example? And is there requirements to get that information out faster? And kind of the old data warehouse model was <laughs> you park it out to the farm, into the hinterlands of the data center and tape and disk and you get it back a couple days later, yep. run some reports now. The requirement is you know, real-time communication. So, so there's been an emphasis of real-time. So, can you share any, any no. input on, to the market out there about what you're experiencing? Yeah, so it's exactly right. The, the data explosion is causing us to, to, to provide innovative ways of, of processing that data. Um, you mentioned Hadoop. You know, uh, Hadoop is a bunch of products combined. I, I think the real component that's useful to us is MapReduce. So what we're trying to do is, is first of all trying to be able to absorb all that data, which is more of a physical problem. You just want to store it. The second problem is the, is the processing, and that's where we're are really- you are you guys using HBase at all? Are you looking at HBase? Is there, is there a database that you, <coughs> that you settle on? Um, Not really, I think now, now we're really trying to figure out what we would like to use the next coming four to five years. There's no doubt that today there are products yeah. out there that will help us, but with the data explosion, the last thing we would like to do is, is to get stuck in it with a product where you know, it works today, but it doesn't work tomorrow. Yeah. What do you think about, the just as an, as an opinion, the general consensus around databases? Uh, you see in that cyclical movement again where yeah. you have uh, a unique purpose-built database and then it gets more general purpose. <laughs> you've That's seen right. you know, OLAB, you've seen Cubes, you've seen things like that and yeah. then it gets back to SQL, so structured, mm -hmm. unstructured. What's your take on all the database situation, unstructured versus structured? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a tough question. I mean, the traditional database that exists today is, is a huge problem because it really doesn't scale. Um, I mean, the only way I think a traditional database will survive is if, if if storage actually will be more based on SSD and, and more RAM based. Um, NoSQL has, has definitely a future, um, but I think for us, it, it's, we, have no, we have no clear winner, right? We really don't know if, if using a NoSQL database is really the answer. But you guys do have like, you know, for example, Facebook, we talk to those guys, and they use um, a lot of unstructured for a lot of their chat yes. messages. So, you know, there's, there's some uh, homegrown mm -hmm. solutions that they had to build because yes. there was no other solution. So, uh, do you guys have a similar kind of experience? Yes, yes. So, yeah, that's what I was referring earlier about the platform. The platform is basically our software layer, where we pick and, pick and choose software components that are available and, and assemble our own, our own workable environment. So for the startups out there that are trying to really create products out there, what's your advice to them being that you would be a potential customer as it gets more mature? Uh, what will you look for? You mentioned stability, is it obviously performance? Yes, I think, that, I think there are three main components. Um, it, it's scalability, stability, and cost. And scalability really means is, is the market is growing so fast that if you had a product, but it doesn't scale, you're really not helping yourself. So you always have to think at least six to 12 months ahead and try to envision where is it going to go if it's successful. Stability means that while you're scaling, you want to make sure that the product doesn't fail while you're scaling. Meaning yeah. that there are, always, there are always issues you're going to yeah. have while you're, while you're growing, but you just yeah. need to be able to address those. Well, the, for the folks watching right here in this live stream, Frederick was on a panel last night that Dave Vellante moderated during HP's large announcement, and I asked a question from the audience, and I really thought your answer was uh, uh, one of the best, which was when I asked about the business models that are changing you know, with the, in the data center, and, and, you know, and, and what are some of the challenges. I, you know, I thought you, your answer, which was essentially what you just said, is really right on, and that is, is that you know, scalability is a really big deal, but also the, the proverbial uptime availability is kind of thrown around like a punchline by vendors, but, mm -hmm. al but ultimately you, you cannot be down. That's right. Can you elaborate on how critical that is? It, it's very critical. So, uh, traditional terminology is you have production and then you have research. So we are kind of a research environment, but our uptime is actually better than our own production teams. Um, it's, it's, it's really a, a challenge, um, you know, but, but, it, but it all comes, it all comes down to engineering and the flexibility you have to, to resolve problems. I mean, people always talk about redundancy. It's like having a, a plan A, which is, you know, it's a perfect world, everything works. Plan B is, well, you, 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 you design it for the, the, typical, um, the typical issues. And plan C is where, you know, what do you do if, if a, a complete storage stack basically disappears out of your environment? And 
it, it, that those are the real, real important components where you have to think of. Well, my final question, we're getting the, the hook here as we wind down, is this. What is uh, on your agenda for this next year? I mean, you don't have to tell us what, what, from a company standpoint, any secret sauce or any kind of the, the family jewels there within Nuance. But what are you watching as, a, as someone who's in the business, who you have to do the research, you have to manage what you're, you're doing, what trends are you watching closely that are really going to be high impact for your business? Well, I think from a business perspective, mobility and healthcare are, are the, the, the two big boomers at this point from a business perspective. From a technology perspective, I, I think storage, storage will evolve really fast in the next 12 months where a lot of people will come up with you know, getting rid of the mechanical device, so to speak, which is really one of the components we need in the, the fast-growing environment. Um, I'm also hoping that the, um, the Hadoop and equivalent market kind of matures, and what I mean with mature is, is that there are a lot of flavors out there, so you, there's no doubt you can put something together, but really mature where, where you, can, you can have millions and millions of, of, of records going in per hour, um, without, you know, without having issues left and right. There's no doubt you can use Hadoop, but you, you do need the infrastructure and the support around it. Well, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. We heard, we heard uh, someone who's in the trenches dealing with it every day, Frederick, telling, sharing his uh, stories and, and critical path items like scale, um, storage is obviously all the rage, and with SSD, Don, Dave Donatelli was sharing the same thing. Obviously Hadoop maturity, totally agree. Uh, great stuff, this is theCUBE. We go out and extract the signal from the noise, there it is. Uh, this is uh, siliconangle.com, exclusive coverage of HP Discover uh, in Frankfurt, uh, Germany. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>